something terrible happened here. And for decades, people didn't talk about it. I was an adult before I ever heard about it. It was something that was, was, was hidden. This entire historic community was obliterated. Bodies dumped in rivers, bodies dumped in mass graves. It was an absolute massacre. This story isn't one you'll find in most history books. And almost 100 years later, the facts of what exactly happened that day are still unraveling. So we're driving in what's known as Black Wall Street. It's where one of the nation's worst episodes of racial violence took place. In 1921, a neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, called the Greenwood District, was a bustling community of Black-owned businesses. Tulsa locals know that period of Greenwood's history as a kind of golden age. If you can imagine just a, um, like an old time downtown, things like um, movie theaters, pharmacies, hair salons, and so forth. They called it Black Wall Street. It was a mecca, it was a huge success. But Black Wall Street was also an anomaly. It thrived at a time when the KKK was incredibly active in Oklahoma, and the nation had just been through the Red Summer of 1919, when white mobs murdered black people in dozens of incidents across the U.S. There needed to be a sort of match or an igniter tossed on these embers, and that event was, that trigger event, was an incident that involved two teenagers, Dick Rowland, 19-year-old, Black boy who shined shoes downtown. Sarah Page, 17 year old white girl who ran an elevator in a downtown building called the Drexel Building. He went to the building, boarded the elevator. Something happened. Sarah Page began to scream. They both ran out of the elevator. Now, we don't know exactly what happened in this elevator, but a day later, Roland was arrested and taken to the courthouse. The local newspaper ran an article claiming Roland had assaulted Page. Even though Page refused to press charges, the article was essentially a call to action for whites. A large white mob began to gather on the lawn of the courthouse. Dick Rowland was in jail on the top floor. A number of black men, several dozen, marched down to the courthouse to protect him. Some of them armed. There was a struggle between one of the black men in the small group and one of the white men in the larger group. And things sort of went south from, from that point. Hundreds of white people descended upon Black Wall Street, armed. Black residents withdrew behind the railroad tracks that marked off the Greenwood District. Some of them were armed and fought back, but they were outnumbered by the white mob, which shot their way through. The white mob murdered. They looted, and they set fire to Black Wall Street. This was the strategy, if you will, of how to deal with these communities, with these successful black communities. The effects were uh, disastrous. For two days, the Greenwood District burned, martial law was declared, and the National Guard was brought in. By the time the massacre ended, Greenwood was in ruins. More than 1,200 homes were destroyed, and 35 blocks burned. The exact number of casualties is harder to pin down. Some initially only reported that white people died. Others reported somewhere between 30 and 100 mostly black casualties. But estimates now put that number closer to 300. As for those that survived, thousands of them lived in tent cities in the months that followed and were left to pick up the pieces of rubble they once called home. After the massacre, the cover-up started. Records went missing from city files, including the very article that started it all. It makes photos from this time all the more important as part of the historical record. But back in 1921, these images served a very different purpose. So photo postcards like these were pretty widely distributed after the massacre. At the time, they were a part of white supremacist culture and kept as souvenirs of racially charged crimes. Now, they're preserved to make sure this part of Tulsa's history isn't forgotten, and they paint a clear picture of how much destruction there was that day. 
On the postcards, it's called the Tulsa Race Riot, a name that itself sort of erases what really happened. By calling it a riot, it's a way of, of trying to rewrite the history, uh, assuming that there were both sides at fault, and that was not the case. I call it a massacre, uh, and I call it that because that's what it was. Greenwood eventually rebuilt, but nearly a century later, there's a part of this story that still haunts the city. No one actually knows where the victims' bodies are. We got to find our people. We got to put them at rest. You know, if not, we continue to be haunted by what was done so many years ago. Kevin Ross, a local writer, is one of many in Tulsa descended from people who lost everything in the massacre. So in this cemetery, there are only two official victims of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Right. How many victims do you think there are? After all these years, I think 300 is putting it mild. In 1997, the city finally put together a commission to study the massacre and help piece together what happened in 1921. They compiled records and eyewitness accounts. The bullets were just raining down over us. They set our house on fire and went right straight to the curtains and set the curtains on fire. These accounts are especially important now because none of these survivors are alive anymore. And they also provided new information. Some mentioned trucks, like this one, loaded with victims of the riot. One riot witness in particular came forth testifying that he saw bodies being dumped in Oaklawn Cemetery. This is it. This is the area. Using the survivor accounts, records, and eventually radar, the city was able to pinpoint three locations with anomalies in the soil. Only one step was left, to excavate. But it was something the city, at the time, wasn't up for doing. For many Tulsans, it was a part of history best forgotten and not worth investigating. In some ways, today, that sentiment remains. Kind of a waste of money. Why do you think that? It's over, it's done with. But there are clear signs of a city that's ready to come to terms with a dark chapter in its history. Honestly, that's a lot of missing people, people that probably had families. We owe it to the people who whose blood has actually fertilized the grounds of this place. There was a tremendous amount of racism. Injustice plus time does not equal justice. Today, a new mayor is reopening the investigation. I think a pretty basic compact that a city makes with its citizens is, if somebody murders you, we will do everything we can to find out what happened to you and give your family closure. And whether that, whether you were murdered yesterday or you were murdered 98 years ago. The city will be looking into the three areas that the commission noted. That process of finding out what lies beneath Tulsa and DNA matching any remains with descendants could take years. The investigation is just one part of a bigger historical reckoning. But the reality is it can't undo the crimes or the cover-up of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. This, this story is the greatest conspiracy of silence that I've ever seen in history. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already heard, we've launched a paid membership program called The Video Lab. For a monthly fee, subscribers get access to tons of special features. Becoming a member is the best way to support our work, so head on over to vox.com join to sign up. See you there.